but more recently it has really spread globally. About three weeks ago we began seeing a significant number of cases occurring outside of China that were uh, reflecting local transmission. And at that point we began to see each day more cases outside of China than in China. During the past few days, we've actually exceeded now the total number of cases occurring globally. Less than half have occurred in China. So we're seeing significant transmission really all around the world. Some of the hottest spots right now are South Korea, also the Eastern Mediterranean area, Europe, including the United Kingdom and Ireland, and also now in the United States and Canada. So there was one, quite, one phrase in there that you used. You used local transmission. Could you, could you explain that to our viewers? Sure. So when the uh, epidemic first started, a lot of the approach to slow the spread and uh, even prevent the entry into the United States for as long as possible focused on contain measures. And that focused primarily on travelers. Early on, the cases that occurred outside of China occurred either in people who were exposed in China, traveled out, became ill after they returned home, or in their household contacts. In some situations, there's been further spread within communities, and this is not unexpected. This is what we would expect to see, uh, say, in an influenza pandemic, where there's a new virus to which the community and indeed the human population around the world has little or no immunity. As we've progressed, we've seen now over 180,000 cases worldwide. Here in the United States, we've seen over 6,000 cases so far. Unfortunately, about 100 people have lost their lives to this infection. The people who are most at risk for these severe infections are people who are older and people who have chronic underlying heart, lung, or kidney disease, and those with diabetes. So there are two things I want to follow up on. As of today, how widespread is the outbreak in the United States? We've now had cases reported from all 50 states, also from Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Guam. So as we talk about where we are in the pandemic, it's important to recognize it is a global pandemic now. So while we'll talk more about travel, I'm sure uh, it's important to think about what's happening in our own communities. One of the questions I wanted to get back to was about, you mentioned the elderly, and this is a population that is at risk and is vulnerable to this disease. Um, can you explain a little bit more about that and how families should be interacting with, with their elder, elderly relatives at this point in time? Yes, um, and this really was, is something that's been observed since the beginning of the epidemic in China, and we're now seeing it in the United States as well. The people at highest risk of severe infection are those who are older, particularly those who are over age 80. Min more than half of the deaths that we've seen in the United States have been among people who live in long-term care facilities. But then also people who have chronic heart conditions, lung disease, uh, kidney failure, or diabetes. For Families, what that means is that it's important that we practice social distancing, particularly with uh, our elders, but also with people who have those underlying conditions. I mean, just as we're sitting six feet apart with a, a virus between us, uh, it's important to do as much communication as possible virtually, such as what we're doing with our, our audience now. For families interacting with uh, elderly people, uh, relatives, uh, grandparents. This is probably not a good time for the grandkids to run and uh, give grandma and grandpa a big hug and a kiss. Uh, this may be a better time for a phone call, for uh, a video chat. Uh, if those type of technologies are not available, even coming uh, by if possible and uh, waving through the window just to be able to maintain that uh, social contact is important. One of the challenges when we talk about social distancing is we don't want social isolation. And it's, it can be very challenging because we know particularly for our elders, having that connectivity with family is very important to mental health as well. But at least for a period of time, it's important that we do things a little differently and make sure that we keep our elders safe. It also is probably a good time to reconsider visiting elderly people who live in long-term care facilities because those seem to be situations that are at particular risk. And most important is if you have any symptoms of a respiratory illness, 
please do not be in contact with people who are elderly or who have underlying heart, lung, kidney disease, or diabetes. And it's probably a good time for us to point out that CDC has guidance for nursing homes on our website, um, and folks can reference that for further information. Yes, there's quite a bit of information on the, the CDC website. I think we have now uh, over 450 different uh, guidance documents out there. And uh, so it's arranged in a tabular form. Also, Google can be useful uh, for finding those documents. But uh, this can be accessed at cdc.gov slash COVID-19. Great. Uh, we talked a little bit about the elderly and their risk to COVID-19. How severe is COVID-19 for the general population? For most people, we're talking about a mild illness. The vast majority of people will not require uh, an interaction with a healthcare provider or uh, certainly not a admission to the, the hospital. Uh, and particularly for younger people and especially children, the illness may be very mild. So uh, it's one of the challenges in controlling it is that uh, the spread may occur from people who have really minimal symptoms. Uh, there's even some evidence that it may spread from people who have uh, no symptoms at all or who have not yet developed the symptoms. So that can be a major challenge. And one of the reasons why social distancing may be the right thing to do right now, because it's easy to say if you're sick, stay home, uh, but it is possible that people who are not yet sick may be able to transmit the virus as well. I think it's safe to assume that if you're sick, you are uh, and have COVID-19, that is the, the person who is most infectious, uh, but there, there may be more to it than that. And there's just so much we still don't know. I mean, yes. as you said, this has only been, this outbreak has only been, you know, three months in, and scientists, our scientists, are still learning so much more about this on a daily basis. Yes, and this is a new coronavirus. I, I frequently hear people say, well, coronavirus is not new. And the family of coronaviruses is not new. So oftentimes household disinfectants will say it, uh, that it deactivates coronavirus. Uh, that's correct. Uh, but there, there's several coronaviruses that have been known for years that cause relatively mild symptoms. The other end of the spectrum, there's also the coronaviruses that cause SARS and one that causes Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, something called MERS. Those are more severe illnesses. So there's a lot that we know about coronaviruses from those diseases, but we're learning a lot because this is a unique coronavirus that we've never seen before. It's also important to recognize there's a whole world of coronaviruses out there that infect other animals. And uh, for instance, if you've uh, ever looked closely at your veterinary bill, you may have seen a charge for coronavirus vaccine. That's actually a vaccine uh, that is for a different type of coronavirus. So there's no evidence that those type of vaccines would provide protection against the COVID-19 virus. So specifically speaking of COVID-19, how, how does this disease spread? How does this particular virus spread? Well, it appears that the vast majority of infections are transmitted by respiratory droplet. And what I mean by that is that the virus infects the respiratory tract, including the upper respiratory tract. So if I cough or sneeze, the spray that's produced will contain the viruses uh, and they will fall as they uh, travel uh, away from me. That's why we're six feet apart. Uh, maybe this is a good time when the virus between us should drop to the floor because that's what would happen in real life. Um, but it's also possible that it can survive on surfaces. And uh, there, there's, there's some laboratory evidence that its survival in the environment is not unlike the SARS virus. So it's also important to be able to uh, clean surfaces with standard household disinfectants, particularly frequently touched surfaces. So that's things like doorknobs and uh, phones and even uh, tabletops because the virus may be able to survive for a period of, of minutes, even hours. And that provides opportunity for the hands to become contaminated. And there's where we get to some of the basic recommendations. It's important to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and water or use an alcohol-based uh, hand cleaner that contains at least 60% alcohol. Uh, it's also important to break the habit of putting your hands to your face. 
uh, because that is one of the ways if your hands are contaminated, you can then uh, inoculate yourself with uh, not just COVID-19, but any number of respiratory viruses. I think we don't think on a daily basis how often we touch our faces. And with this outbreak, you become much more cognizant of that and have to be more cognizant of that. Um, one of the things that I've heard just, you know, anecdotally, the way that people are determining how long to wash their hands is they sing happy birthday twice. Yes. And that that's a sufficient and that's a great way to teach children um, how long they should be washing their hands with soap and water under warm water. So just a little trick for our viewers right. out there. Or, or the alphabet. Uh, a colleague in Louisiana uh, said, uh, wash your hands like you're at a crawfish boil and you need to take your contacts out. <laughs> okay, love that one. That's regional. Um, so one of the big questions that we get often and is probably one of the most difficult questions for our subject matter experts to answer is about when the outbreak will end. Um, can you help inform that discussion a little bit? Well, there's a lot of variables that will drive when this epidemic or pandemic will end. Uh, and in many ways, I think uh, we would like it to end as soon as possible, uh, particularly those of us who've been involved in it for several months now. It could, the end couldn't come soon enough. But there's actually, I'm going to say something that may be surprising to many people, is that in many ways we want the pandemic to spread out over as long a period as possible. And I think many people have heard discussions about flattening the curve. And this means that we want the pandemic to uh, affect as few a people as possible at any, any given period of time. In other words, if uh, the, we had, say, 10,000 people in a community who became sick, if they all get sick over a two-week period, that could overwhelm the healthcare system and really shut everything down for a, peri a period of time and put lives at risk. If it's 10,000 cases over a period of three to four months, that may be something the community can manage, uh, society can continue, and also the healthcare system could be robust to be able to take care of people who might have more severe symptoms. So uh, when will it run its full course? We don't know for sure. As we look at influenza pandemics, oftentimes they begin to abate after 12 to 18 months. You also raise a, a question that uh, you haven't asked, but I bet many of our uh, viewers are, are wondering because they've heard about it. Is, is this a, an infection that will go away in the summertime? Mm -hmm. We know that influenza generally does go away. Uh, we know from the pandemic of 2009, although the virus first emerged and there were many infections uh, late in the springtime, there was then a lull through the summer months. We don't know about this coronavirus yet. So while it would be optimistic to think we're going to get a break in the summertime, we'll have more time to prepare for what may come in the fall, it's important to recognize, as we've said earlier, this is a virus that we didn't know existed three months ago. And we really don't know yet how it will be influenced by the warmer months in the northern hemisphere. One of the points you raised was about the stress on the healthcare infrastructure of our nation. Um, and while we do have one of the best systems in the world, uh, heavy, a heavy burden on that infrastructure could present some problems. And so I, I wonder if you might address um, when people should visit an ER, when people should visit a doctor's office, and should they call ahead to their doctor before going into the office? I think that would be helpful for folks at home, but also be helpful to the healthcare care providers right. that are triaging these cases. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge just the heroic job being done by uh, health care providers all over the country right now, particularly in those communities that have been most heavily impacted. Uh, in parts of the country, the health care system is already stressed uh, to the breaking point, and people are working long hours under very difficult conditions. In terms of uh, the health care system and how we can best uh, keep it resilient, it's important that plans are, are put in place, which uh, are generally uh, there in uh, each hospital. I mean, many hospitals have done tabletop exercises of what to do in a flu pandemic. Those plans are still very useful in this situation, even though this is a virus that's very different from influenza. So things like elective procedures or office visits that uh, might be able to be deferred until uh, particularly several weeks or months down the road, this is the right time to do that. So for the general public, 
that uh, involves some patience and flexibility to mm -hmm. understand if uh, an elective uh, surgery is being rescheduled or a visit to your provider uh, is being uh, bumped further down the, the schedule. Uh, understand that this is part of how we keep the healthcare system robust to be able to take care of those people who do get very sick with COVID-19. Um, in terms of uh, people who become ill with respiratory illnesses, uh, two thoughts on that. First of all, uh, we are still in the, the flu season, so most likely it'll be something other than COVID-19. Uh, if it is COVID-19, the vast majority of people will have relatively mild illness. So um, it's important that just everybody with a runny nose doesn't come running into the emergency department. It's wise though to be on alert for the more severe symptoms. So a very high fever, shortness of breath, uh, tightness or fullness in the chest. Those are the kind of things that may reflect that uh, there's a more serious manifestation. And if those develop, pick up the phone, uh, call either your uh, provider or the emergency department in advance so you can get instructions on how to come into the healthcare system in a way that'll minimize the risk of exposure to others who may not have COVID-19. Of course, if there are symptoms of uh, a life-threatening problem, whether it be COVID-19 or uh, the tightness in the chest as a heart attack, call 911 uh, because those things are still gonna happen and that's an important component of why maintaining the robust responsiveness of the healthcare system is important because COVID-19 will not prevent people from falling down the stairs and breaking bones. It will not prevent automobile accidents. There are going to continue to be uh, traumatic events that occur and uh, acute illnesses that occur that have nothing to do with the pandemic that will require care in the healthcare system. So good reminder that our healthcare professionals and ERs across the country are also triaging a host of other medical conditions in addition to COVID-19. Absolutely. I'm gonna shift gears just a, a little bit here because we've got a lot of questions. The next question we have is, should Americans be concerned about traveling to other countries or about travelers from other countries coming to the United States? Well, I think in general, let me just start by saying this is not uh, the best time to travel. And at uh, the CDC website, cdc.gov slash COVID-19, uh, you can find links then to advice to travelers. There are a number of countries where we recommend that anyone who is considering travel uh, seriously consider delaying it unless it's somehow essential travel. Uh, China has been in that category for a couple of months now, but that's expanded now to include South Korea, Iran, really all 26 nations of the European Union, the United Kingdom, and also Ireland. Also, people who travel anywhere in the world, we recommend if you are at risk of more severe COVID-19 illness, and that would be people who are older, people with underlying heart, lung, kidney uh, disease, or diabetes, it's gonna be best to defer that travel. We also recommend that no one should be traveling on cruise liners right now. Our experience to date has been that once COVID-19 is on board uh, a cruise liner, uh, it can uh, spread very rapidly and uh, attack rates can be much higher than we're seeing in communities. So for individuals coming back into the country, we've seen some new advisories go up recently. Um, we've heard a lot about transmission in the European Union um, and those flights coming back into the United States. Could you, could you for a moment just address for those folks, Americans and right. legal residents that are coming back into the United States, how that process is working and what role CDC is playing with that? Right, so if you're traveling back from one of these areas where the travel advisories are in place, uh, we recommend first of all that you not travel if you're sick. Uh, when you re-enter the United States, there'll be uh, a process of a, a brief assessment of your, your health, There's, uh, you'll be directed uh, through one of 13 airports uh, in the United States. If you're traveling from one of the Asian countries involved or from, uh, from Europe, and uh, you may be directed to talk to one of the CDC quarantine doctors who are there. Well, there'll be uh, an interview and an assessment. And if you've developed symptoms during the flight, you'll be uh, advised and directed to where to get medical care. 
If you're well, you'll be allowed to continue on with your uh, domestic itinerary, and it's important for people to realize this is different than what was done initially for travels coming out of Hubei province in central China, where there was quarantine facilities set up in different parts of the country. Our emphasis now, because of the continued spread of the virus and the, the breadth of the pandemic, is that you quarantine at home for a period of 14 days. And this is to reduce the risk of spread from these other countries uh, into new communities in the United States. And this is part of that overall process of how we spread the curve out. Even as we see some transmission in the United States, some communities seeing quite a bit, this is a way to prevent additional transmission in the United States and to slow the progress of the pandemic. Uh, should we be concerned about travel within the U.S.? We've seen some high-profile leaders like Dr. Fauci, for example, from NIH, indicate that at his age and his preference would be not to travel at this point in time. Um, what is the CDC recommendation on travel within the United States? Well, Dr. Fauci is uh, in line with the CDC recommendations. Uh, and while uh, Dr. Fauci is, is quite robust and uh, incredibly intelligent, uh, he has also been around a, a long time. So we do recommend that people who are older not travel right now, if there's any way to avoid that, and also the people who have chronic heart, lung, or kidney diseases. Perfect. Um, the next question that we have is, um, what should people consider to avoid, how should people consider avoiding stigmatizing particular groups or products? Yeah, so let's uh, address the two questions there uh, separately. Uh, first of all, it, it's throughout history, there's been uh, blame placed uh, on different groups of people uh, for different types of diseases. And uh, it, it's important to recognize that this uh, COVID-19 is now a global disease. Uh, it affects everyone. So there really is no justification to stigmatize anyone or particularly any racial or ethnic group uh, related to, to COVID-19. For people who have traveled, uh, while social distancing uh, may be important, it's also important to not be socially isolated and certainly not to uh, shun people and certainly not to shame people either. Mm -hmm. There's very little evidence that that's going to lead to additional healthy behaviors. Now, the question about products uh, relates back to our earlier discussion about transmission. There were a lot of questions early on about uh, products that were made in central China. Of course, the supply chain. China is, plays a very important role in the global uh, supply chain, as does the European Union mm -hmm. and uh, the United States. And there was concern, well, is the virus being transmitted uh, via these products or uh, by mail even? And while in, under laboratory conditions, the, the virus can uh, survive on paper or cardboard products for a period of time, the epidemiology does not indicate that that is what has uh, spread the virus. If this were a virus that were transmitted through the mail, we would have seen more hot spots popping up all around the world very early on. What we saw instead, as cases occurred outside of China, they were occurring initially in travelers who came out of China and were well during their time of travel, during the incubation period before illness onset, and then became ill after arrival. If there was subsequent transmission, it was most often to their household contacts, the people they were uh, most closely associated with. So, we really don't think that mail or products that have come out of any part of the world have pay, played a significant role in spread of this infection. Since this outbreak began, there have been a number of new words, terminology right. introduced into America's lexicon. Some of the most common are the words quarantine, isolation, and social distancing. I think sometimes people get confused between what a quarantine means versus what isolation means. Right. So could we start with that? We've addressed a little bit about social distancing, and I'll ask you to go into more detail on that in a minute. But I think the differentiation between what it means to be quarantined versus being in isolation, um, there's a difference there. And 
Let's clarify that for our viewers. There, there certainly is. And uh, while these may sound like technical terms, they may even seem like they could be used interchangeably, mm -hmm. and unfortunately oftentimes are, they mean very different things. So quarantine means separating uh, someone who has been exposed to an infectious agent from people who are unexposed. It's not a tool that's been used very often recently in public health. And uh, it's oftentimes more challenging to do because you're basically taking people who are healthy and feel good, separating them from their loved ones sometimes, and that can be, be a challenge. But it's a, a tool that has been used really for uh, centuries with uh, varying degrees of, of success. Isolation is much more commonly used, and it's used every day in hospitals all around the country. Isolation means taking someone who is sick and infected with a specific organism and separating them from people who are well. So you're trying to prevent transmission of the infection to the people who are well. And there's various types of isolation. Uh, there are specific guidelines for respiratory droplets, such as what we were talking about earlier. Uh, there's also specific guidelines for airborne pathogens, which we, we don't see a lot of evidence that uh, this virus is commonly transmitted by the airborne route. Even though under laboratory uh, conditions, we can get it into the air and show that it can be there for a while, this is not like tuberculosis or measles, uh, where we think it's common that the transmission is, is through the air. Um, quarantine uh, achieves the goal of uh, being able to prevent transmission that may occur early in the course of the illness. Isolation achieves the goal of preventing transmission throughout the course of illness. And we should mention that you had spoken about the, the early flights, for example, of repatriated Americans right. from Hubei province, um, some of the passengers aboard the Diamond uh, Princess, right. the cruise ship. They were in quarantine, um, many of them. And, and the resilience of the American people was demonstrated in those situations because, by and large, everybody was very grateful to have. We've received notices from many of them. They were compliant. They or they understood the complexity of the outbreak and were very um, willing to respond to recommendations. And so I think it's just as a point of reference just to acknowledge that right. um, when Americans know what's happening and they're asked to rise to the occasion, they are doing so, and that we're all in this together. If right. you wanted to put an emphasis on that, I'd be happy to. Well, first of all, we recognize that none of us uh, wants to have our freedom of movement restricted. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's always a challenge to strike that balance between our individual uh, freedoms and liberties and what's good for the, the larger community. Uh, I, my heart particularly goes out to people on the Diamond Princess, many of whom were quarantined on board the ship for a period of time. And then because there was evidence of ongoing exposure, had to again be quarantined upon uh, return to the United States. That was a long period of time to uh, be oftentimes separated from family and other, other loved ones. Um, so that's, that's not a tool, uh, quarantine is not a tool that we take lightly uh, right. by, by any stretch. Uh, I will add, um, though, in terms of the resilience of the American people, I uh, w had some uh, reports of the first uh, group of repatriated American citizens coming out of uh, Wuhan in China. Uh, they uh, landed for refueling in Anchorage, yes. Alaska, mm -hmm. and uh, when the uh, CDC official from the quarantine station went on board, uh, he was really unsure what the, the reaction would be, but I, I'm told that when he said, welcome to the United States, there was uh, laughter and a round of applause. People were very glad to be home. And yeah. I think that's important for us to remember that our fellow citizens were very glad to be home again. That's right. Um, and that's a nice segue for us because you were the former public health leader in Alaska at one time. And our next question has to do with what can state and local health departments do to prepare for those that perhaps haven't yet had a big outbreak within their jurisdiction? Um, what can they prepare for and how can they respond to this outbreak? Well, I think it also ties into another question that we're frequently asked is, uh, are we prepared? And preparedness is not an all or none phenomenon. I think we are more prepared now than we were 20 years ago. 
Uh, so it's a, a progress, and it's an ongoing uh, process that is a progression. Uh, for instance, every state has gone through some type of pandemic exercise, planning how do we work together, um, and you know who are the people that uh, need to be in touch. Uh, there's an old saying that an emergency is a terrible time to start exchanging business cards. Uh, but of course, there's also the, the old expression that uh, no battle plan withstands the stress of combat. So uh, these, uh, these exercises help us to prepare, but they don't answer all the questions. So in terms of uh, the ongoing response and preparedness for what's next, uh, we try to stay in close touch with our, our state, local, and tribal public health leaders and provide uh, technical advice and fortunately, uh, thanks to some appropriation from Congress, we've been able to provide some funding locally as well. The uh, local uh, jurisdictions have been uh, pulling together, I think practically every state has uh, activated an emergency operations center, which provides uh, a center of operations because this is, while it is at, at its foundation, a health issue, the impact is much broader than mm -hmm. just health. It impacts education, it impacts commerce, it you know, really tra uh, transportation is heavily impacted. So it really requires everybody working together to be able to respond and to be prepared for what's next. In terms of knowing what's next, that's where uh, the national data that's aggregated by CDC can be very useful to look at where are the hot spots, uh, what are some of the travel connections that might help you anticipate when the, the virus is coming in? The WHO website is also very good to get uh, some visibility on what's going on all around the world. So you mentioned some funding that's been approved by Congress to help local and state governments right. um, build their capacity. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that so that folks watching understand um, what locals are actually doing, what the states and the local health departments will be doing with that funding to build capacity. What does that mean to build capacity? Where is right. that, what, what does that mean? Well, it's really uh, intended to be flexible for uh, the state or local agency involved because we recognize that the needs may be different in different parts of the country. Some of the state public health labs are fairly robust in terms of being able to scale up and process a fairly large number of specimens. Others have more challenges, and to be honest, some state uh, public health departments have had to struggle with declining uh, funding in recent years. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's been a challenge for preparedness. There's, there's an old saying that uh, at the airport, you don't wait till there's a plane crash to buy a fire truck. Um, unfortunately, we, we do have some of our partners who are really struggling with the response, and that's where funding can be very helpful to gear up however it's needed, whether it's uh, public health nurses to be able to be out and do uh, case investigations, uh, health educators to help get good messages that are appropriate for the community, uh, epidemiologists to be able to study the data that's being collected locally. It, it's really intended to be uh, flexible. The public health funding, though, is specifically not designated for treatment centers. And there are other streams of funding that will help support those aspects of the response. There's also now funds that are available more broadly as part of a disaster response, which will assist locally in terms of being able to provide uh, emergency care facilities as needed. You mentioned um, just a moment ago some of the community um, ripple effects of an outbreak and an emergency response, whether it was transportation or other things, business, commerce. Specifically, there are a lot of businesses that interface with customers, have contact, right. close contact with customers on a daily basis. What is CDC's guidance um, for those businesses? Well, uh, for details, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned cdc.gov slash COVID-19 <laughs> yet, but I will mention Can't it again. Can't do enough of that. Yeah, there, uh, but there are specific guidelines for businesses. Briefly, that involves some of the basic concepts around social distancing as much as possible, but also hand hygiene. And for management of employees, making sure that you have policies in place so that people who are sick cannot come into work. So looking at uh, sick leave policies and making sure that people are able to take time off if they are sick so that they don't potentially expose uh, your customers are important. 
In terms of hand hygiene, uh, not everybody can install a, a sink in the, the lobby, say if you're, you're a bank, but you can uh, make hand gel available. You can also make sure that your employees at the, say, the teller window have uh, the ability to be able to sanitize their hands as often as possible. So there's, there's a number of steps there in terms of how to keep not only your employees safe, but uh, also your, your customers. Customer. And finally, there's uh, alternative ways to, to do business, which uh, are being implemented in very many parts of the country right now. For instance, restaurants are uh, being re encouraged, in some areas required to provide only takeout services to be able to minimize that person-to-person uh, -person contact. And the social distancing to keep people exactly. in proximity, the proper level of proximity. That's right. So, so drive-by services uh, actually are probably more important now than ever. Uh, services that can be delivered remotely or uh, virtually. Uh, you know, even in healthcare, there's a role for telemedicine that's mm -hmm. very uh, important uh, for people who don't require hands-on medical care. One of the other big areas of discussion, obviously, is guidance for K-12 school systems. Um, where are we with that guidance today? Well, last week, CDC posted some guidelines uh, for school closures. And uh, the decision to close schools is uh, a very complex one. So it's important that uh, health, as well as education, uh, most importantly, the, the school administrators or the school district superintendents are involved in that discussion. And while it's not unlike what uh, decisions that have to be made when there's uh, adverse weather conditions, whether it's black ice or uh, after a, a big windstorm or an earthquake, uh, this is different because uh, the perception may be different. Uh, there's more fear uh, around the ongoing aspects of the, the pandemic, but also school closure may be for a longer period of time. So when we talk about some of the, the pros, we're looking at social distancing again. How do we uh, separate kids from one another? Of course, uh, schools can be uh, congregate settings, mass gatherings uh, of, a, of a small scale, and uh, we want to be able to minimize that contact. But there's also a number of downsides. Uh, there's a large proportion of uh, children who receive one, even two meals a day at school. And how do we make sure that they're continuing to get nutritious food? Uh, we also uh, know that when schools are suddenly closed, that can stress the healthcare system because doctors, nurses, um, particularly if there's uh, two parents working, uh, somebody has to stay home to take care of the kids. And it may not be easy to immediately uh, set up that type of, uh, that type of uh, care. Uh, another consideration is uh, who is going to take care of the kids. Uh, if, uh, the, if grandma's 85 years old and the kids uh, also have a, a respiratory illness, that actually could be a, a problem. So uh, school closure is very complex. That guideline is available at the CDC website uh, because nationally there are uh, school closures in at least 37 states mm -hmm. right now. There are literally millions of kids uh, who are uh, home, uh, homeschooling has never been more popular than it is right now. Uh, we are working hard to develop some uh, additional guidelines that people consider, can review and consider as they look at the possibility of reopening down the road. Uh, the last thing about school closure that I think is important for everyone to understand is uh, right now we're in uh, a, a time, uh, in some ways a national timeout almost, in terms of seeing what the impact of this pandemic over the next one to two, three weeks is going to be. It may be that schools will reopen fairly soon, but as we progress, it's possible they will need to close again. So uh, I think it, as we, we go forward, we continue to learn about how this virus behaves. The recommendations may, may shift because getting back to our uh, opening comments, uh, this is something that uh, not only is it unique, but we didn't even know it existed three months ago. And I think it's important to point out with all of these recommendations CDC is making, um, that there is not a one-size-fits-all approach for all jurisdictions across the country, that really Absolutely. local authorities have to make decisions predicated on their populations, on the considerations, the level of outbreak, et cetera, within, within their communities. Right, and the possibility of doing uh, any type of uh, 
virtual distance delivered uh, education is quite variable also. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, all of us will be learning a lot more about distance delivered education over the next few months. Right, and I'm gonna get to that at the higher ed level as well. Yes. But, but one of the things I did wanna go backtrack on very quickly is you had mentioned that there's a level of fear. Um, and I've heard you address this in the past about um, there's a difference between preparation and, uh, and being scared. Right. And so if you could address that briefly, because I think it's important since that's come up in our discussion that folks understand um, and we, we provide some level of, of calm and comfort um, to our viewers to understand, again, some of the topics you've talked about right. that most of us, it will be a mild outbreak. Um, but if you could address that specific issue. Sure, uh, well, let me start. At the risk of sounding like a, a bumper sticker, the mm -hmm. advice is be prepared, don't be scared. Uh, because we know that uh, people who are motivated primarily by fear uh, may do irrational things. Uh, if you live in an area where that's prone to tornadoes, if there's a tornado warning, you don't go running down the street. You seek shelter and you take cover. Uh, if there's uh, an earthquake, you don't you try to avoid things that may fall on you. You try to uh, duck in cover. And similarly, uh, in a pandemic, it's important that we understand uh, as much as we can about the disease and the steps that can help protect us. And that's where we start the conversation with this particular virus and at this point in the pandemic about social distancing, uh, protecting others by staying home if you're sick, trying to avoid other people who may be uh, sick as well, and looking out for the, the interests of those who may be at higher risk of a more severe illness. And I wanted to backtrack to the higher education piece, just if you wanted to add something onto that. Is there different guidance for higher education, university systems, et cetera, versus the K through 12 guidance? Yeah, there are uh, different guidelines. Uh, they're, they're not um, so much different guidelines as there's a different focus because obviously a kindergarten is very uh, different from uh, a graduate uh, class in, in any uh, discipline. Uh, universities, are probably in general uh, more well uh, set up to be able to do distance delivered education. Uh, so a number of universities, universities have already made the decision for the remainder of this semester to not have in-person classes. Mm -hmm. And this will also help with reducing the amount of travel. Uh, universities are also fairly unique in terms of the number of uh, international students as well as the amount of international travel as uh, students may want to go overseas or do a semester outside of the United States. Um, they function a bit differently than primary schools. So there's uh, both assets that are available at the university level but also uh, some unique risks, uh, primarily because we, there's so much more travel associated right. with attendance to, at university. If ever there was a time to be kind to your neighbor, now would probably it be it. Um, are there recommendations for how individual neighborhoods, community groups, um, civic groups can be mindful at this particular point in time and helping one another through this period of transition? Yeah, it's important to know uh, more than ever who, who your neighbors are uh, and if you can find out if there are people who need help, do that. And that can be done virtually. There, there really are uh, advantages of some of the online neighborhood groups. Uh, I saw one recently where uh, someone offered, uh, if someone uh, needs uh, groceries, let me know. I'm, 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 reti I'm a retiree, but I'm, uh, I'm, health I'm a young retiree, I'm healthy. I'll be glad to make that run. All I'm asking is reimbursement for the mm -hmm. amount on the receipt. Uh, and uh, you know, look at, we do need to look out uh, for one another. So uh, it's not a time to stand hand in hand, but it is a time to stand together, uh, all those six feet apart. Right, we all have a role to play in this. Um, you mentioned early on the issue of transportation, uh, and there have been a lot of questions about public transportation right. and should individuals who have commute, regular commutes on public transportation or children that are commute to school on public transportation, um, should they be doing this at this time or are, is there a recommendation that maybe they opt for a different mode of travel? Yeah, public transportation really is uh, a major challenge because oftentimes these conveyances can be uh, quite crowded. Uh, there's a lot of high touch surfaces such as uh, the bars we hang on to when the, mm -hmm. the, the subway starts or uh, stops. 
Uh, so uh, we certainly are concerned about the risk of uh, transmission in those settings. Uh, the, the most important thing is, again, if you are sick, stay home because uh, you don't want to be going on to a bus or a subway uh, with a, a cough and potentially uh, infecting other people. Uh, it's also uh, highlighting the important role of business in encouraging teleworking to be able to lighten the load on the public transit system. And then uh, if the load uh, can be lightened enough, that might provide an opportunity for more social distancing aboard uh, the, the public transportation uh, routes as well. Um, it's important, uh, it's probably uh, good if you can get uh, some of the, the small pocket-sized uh, hand gel containers. Mm -hmm. I understand in many parts of the country they're, they're hard to get, but that's uh, a great thing to be able to have uh, to do hand hygiene. Uh, if you've been uh, on board a, a, a subway, for instance, and holding on to the bar, uh, think about that touch surface and uh, for sure and practice hand hygiene as much as possible. Keep your hand away from your face. So we've had some guidance this week about mass gatherings as well. Um, and we talk about mass gatherings, we're referring to things like public events, whether they're sporting events, whether they're conferences, business conferences, um, all types of events of that nature. Um, there's been new guidance. Can you speak to the new guidance that's come out this week with respect to mass uh, events and also um, to social gatherings? Yeah, um, and the, the newer guidance uh, is based on some of the observations of how the virus has been transmitted, <clears throat> excuse me, to a relatively large number of people in some settings where people are gathered together. So it may be time that we abandon the term mass gathering, <coughs> excuse me, and focused instead on gatherings in general. A uh, question that's come up often is, well, how many people should that be? And as you can imagine, that might be um, really variable depending on the type of event. Uh, here in this room, we, there's five of us. We're the closest of the five people who are here. Uh, so this is probably a low-risk gathering. On the other hand, if we were sitting next to one another across the front here, that might be a higher-risk uh, gathering. So at this point in time, the recommendation is to minimize those gatherings altogether. Uh, gatherings of more than 10 people, I think, have been particularly called out as uh, of concern. And uh, we realize that that's very disruptive because now we've gone beyond just uh, large uh, faith-based gatherings or business conferences, but really we're, we're talking about things like uh, weddings and uh, family gatherings. Um, so it's, uh, it's not easy. Of course, uh, sporting events have been canceled, uh, live uh, audience TV shows uh, have either gone without audiences or have been uh, canceled altogether. So uh, we do recognize that it's disruptive, but this is uh, an important part of how we at least start uh, social distancing until we know more about how this pandemic is going to progress and what we can do to slow it. So at the outset of our conversation, we talked quite a bit about the healthcare setting and some of the challenges presented to them today and potentially in the future. One of the questions that's come to us is about, is it safe to go to a hospital? And I think it might be important to share where CDC provides uh, technical advice uh, in this respect, both to, you mentioned, right. um, how you enter a, a room, a visitation room, and how to not uh, disturb and infect others in the room, um, but also about infection control in general in healthcare settings. Could you speak to both of those issues? Well, first of all, if you have a life-threatening condition or have been in an accident, it's, it is important to mm -hmm. seek care still. So we're not telling people don't go to the hospital, but we are encouraging people to delay unnecessary visits and also to limit uh, visitation to individuals who are in the hospital. Again, this is part of social distancing. CDC has some very specific guidelines for healthcare providers to protect themselves as well as uh, to protect uh, the people that they're caring for. One of the challenges, though, that we, we have to acknowledge is that the global supply chain for personal protective equipment is uh, quite strained right now. And so in some parts of the country, the protective equipment is running thin. So CDC is also looking at ways to be able to work with the materials that we have available so that the healthcare system can be flexible uh, during this uh, very challenging time.
So when we talk about protective equipment to kind of break that down for our viewers, we oftentimes use shorthand. We talked about PPE yes. or protective gear and what does protective gear encompass and, um, and what are the most significant parts of protective gear? gear for the healthcare community. Right, so uh, we're talking about things like masks, uh, goggles to protect the eyes, gloves, um, you know, very broadly. Uh, in terms of the COVID-19, one of the particular issues have, has surrounded uh, masks. Mm -hmm. And there's two types of masks. Uh, and of course, there's, there's more than just two because we see them uh, increasingly in the community as well. But from a healthcare standpoint, there are the types of masks that actually filter the air. Uh, N95 is a term people have heard quite a bit lately. And that's to prevent inhalation of, uh, of, the, of viruses, particularly airborne viruses. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, possible that we believe that this virus could become airborne in certain hospital situations where aerosols are generated by medical procedures. On the other hand, surgical masks uh, provide uh, more broadly some protection against uh, respiratory droplet type infections. Uh, and also sometimes we'll put a respiratory, uh, we'll put a surgical mask on someone who is ill with a respiratory illness if you will, as a splatter shield, so that if they cough or sneeze, uh, those droplets are contained within the mask. So surgical masks have both a protective role uh, for people who are not sick and for people who are sick to, to prevent spread. And individuals, you know, we saw a rush at the outset of the outbreak for individuals to buy masks and so forth. It's important to know that we need to preserve those for our healthcare right. workers that are treating those who may come down with COVID-19. That's right, and uh, CDC does not recommend uh, use of masks in the general community, and that's not a new recommendation. Mm -hmm. That's been a standing recommendation for some time, primarily because there's not a lot of evidence that there's benefit. Uh, we also are concerned about the exposure of hands to the face, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, I've just anecdotal observation, not true scientific data. I've uh, watched people in public who are wearing a mask and how often they put their hand to their face to adjust the mask or to push it away from their eyes. It really makes me wonder uh, if it actually may have a, a negative benefit on the risk of infection as well. Mm -hmm. How can people in their community stay plugged in and be, continue to be informed about COVID-19. Obviously, we've talked about the CDC resources quite a bit, but in their local area, how can they best get connected right. um, to what's happening there? Well, in addition to uh, the WHO and the CDC websites, uh, each state has uh, a COVID-19 website and many uh, cities and counties do as well. So that's probably your best uh, choice to be able to find out what's going on in your area, as well as what some of the specific recommendations are. Because uh, while every state has been involved, the intensity of involvement is quite variable around the country. Some country, some uh, cities are seeing quite a bit of activity right now. Other areas, it's, it's more like spots where uh, the disease pops up and there does not seem to be as much community transmission yet. So I know that your grandfather I'm a mother. Um, my children ask me questions on a daily basis about this outbreak and what they should be doing, what their friends should be doing. Their school life has been turned over. Um, what should we be telling our children about this outbreak at this time? Well, I think it's important to be honest with children. Uh, we, we shouldn't uh, you know, say uh, things that are untrue or uh, overly reassuring. But at the same time, there's no reason to, to scare kids. And a lot of the things that uh, we can all do are things that we already tell our kids in terms of washing your hands, uh, covering your cough. Uh, it's more important now than ever. Uh, and explaining things about why schools have closed, uh, that may be a little tougher, but uh, I think it's, it's okay to frame it in terms of, well, school sometimes closes if there's snow or if there's a storm or if there's earthquake damage. I mean, these are all things that can be scary, but they're things that we've experienced in the past. So being able to relate uh, to experiences that a child has already had so they can be more confident that uh, this is something that uh, we'll get through as well, I think can be very helpful. And of course, it's gonna be different for, for every kid. 
uh, just oh. like adults. Well, Some are more easily groups. scared than others. Right. right. So age group, I'm sure the message needs to be massaged a little differently. Right. And, um, and in every family, right. uh, each kid may be different. So exactly. that does highlight the important role that parents and grandparents play in being able to, to live, deliver those messages in a way that's uh, the right message for each kid. Right. And a lot of grandparents have lived through outbreaks, right? right. So they were in their youth perhaps exposed to measles um, and other disease outbreaks and they can share what that time was like. They can speak from firsthand experience right. which is quite different. Um, I wanted to thank you for um, all of your time so far. We have a few more minutes. I'd like to take a couple questions if we have time um, in these great. last remaining minutes that we've received from the public. Great. Um, one of the, the questions, the first questions I'm going to pose to you is about vaccine development and therapeutics. Um, how quickly could a vaccine be available to Americans? Well, first of all, thank you for that, very broadly for that question, because we've talked a lot about hand hygiene and social distancing, quarantine, isolation. Uh, these are some of the important tools in our, our toolbox, but some of our uh, tools that we're most accustomed to using, such as uh, in influenza, such as antiviral drugs or vaccines, are not there yet. So there's ongoing work to develop uh, antiviral drugs or to look at different types of antibodies that can be used in treatment of the infection. At this point in time, treatment is really symptomatic. Uh, so uh, it's important to recognize that this isn't like in influenza where there's uh, availability of Tamiflu. Uh, we have no tools like that right now. A vaccine will ultimately be uh, the best way to protect the entire population uh, against this coronavirus. Unfortunately, um, it will probably be at least a year to a year and a half out. We are at the point where there is a, a candidate vaccine that's entering into some human trials, and these are very early on, and this includes assessment of what's the best dose of the vaccine, how safe is it, and then it needs to move through the next phase so that it can be evaluated in terms of how effective it is and how often uh, are there any rare side effects that uh, we need to consider. Uh, the overall goal is we want to make sure that any vaccine that's recommended for the general public, that we can be confident that it's safe and that it is going to be protective as much as possible. Dr. Butler, thank you so much for your time today. You have been very gracious with your expertise and, and the commitment of time that you've given to us this afternoon. Um, we, are taking the, uh, we are going to be approaching the top of the hour, and so we're gonna close out today's discussion with a couple of reminders, some things that we've pointed out earlier in our discussion. Uh, if we did not address your questions today, please visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. We are also encouraging you to visit the website for your state and local health departments so that you can learn the latest information about COVID-19 in your area. And if you're looking for global information, please visit the World Health Organization's website at who.int. Thank you for joining us today and have a great day.